November we had communion. We started to look at the kingdom of God. And we're going to continue now in that vein for the next several weeks. Different aspects of that kingdom. Because it's a sad thing that many people do not understand what the kingdom of God is and the gospel that pertains to the kingdom. So this morning we're going to look at uh, eternal life and we're going to look at its relationship to the resurrection. Serene Jones, a PhD from Yale University, ordained in 1991 both in the Christian Church from Disciples of Christ and in the United Church of Christ. She taught at Yale University for 17 years. She's currently the president of a seminary founded in 1836. She doesn't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. She doesn't believe in the power of prayer. She doesn't believe in a literal heaven. And she doesn't believe in miracles. And this is a president of a, of a seminary. Union Theological Seminary, known as UTS in New York, another place, possibly California could be worse, is the oldest independent seminary in Christian tradition. It was founded in 1836 by the members of the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America. The non-denominational UTS has an endowment of 108 million, and it's been a real plus for the progressive Christianity movement, the birthplace of black theology, womanist theology, and other theological movements. Other theological movements. Although UTS founding constitution stated that the seminary's goal was to promote the kingdom of Christ. <clears throat> And professors were required to affirm they believed the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament to be the word of God. And the only infallible rule of practice would be the word of God. Today, UTS is more about progressive ideology than religion, which is made clear in its about page. If you want to go online and look it up. Today the seminary serves out this formal calling to service by training people of all faiths or by training people of no faith. People who are, who are called to work the work of social justice in the world with roots that are firmly planted in the Protestant tradition, Union actively reforms itself in response to changing the needs of the world and an evolving understanding of what it means to be faithful. Serene Jones, president of Union Theological Seminary in New York, made these comments in an interview with Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times from an article published Easter weekend. Although the author's intent may have been to inspire leaders, it also served as a spotlight regarding the leftward drift of many seminaries. Their founding constitution, as I stated earlier, was to promote the kingdom of Christ, and professors were required to affirm their belief in the Old and New required to affirm their belief in the Old and New Testaments. A lot of the uh, states' founding constitutions were the same, and if no one could affirm to that, no one could swear to that, they weren't allowed to serve in political office. But as Jones made it clear in her interview, the seminary is very different. It's a very different school today. She rejects the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Quote, when you look in the Gospels, the stories are all over the place. There is no resurrection story in Mark, just an empty tomb. And those who claim to know whether or not it happened are kidding themselves. Crucifixion is not something that God is orchestrating from upstairs. It's a pervasive idea that an abuse of God Father who sends his own kid to the cross so God could forgive people is nuts. 
For me, the gift people is nuts. For me, the cross is an enactment of our human hatred. But what happened on Easter is the triumph of love in the midst of suffering. That's PhD language for BS. I almost yeah. said the word. Mm -hmm. But they have nice, fanciful words. Isn't that the reason for hope? She rejects the idea that God miraculously heals through prayer. She rejects the virgin birth. I find the virgin birth a bizarre claim, she said. It has nothing to do with Jesus' message. The virgin birth only becomes important if you have a theology in which sexuality is considered sinful. It also promotes this notion that pure, untouched female bodies are the best. And that, I and that idea has led to centuries of oppressing women. By the way, she formerly was the Titus Street Professor of Theology at Yale Divinity School and Chair Gender Woman and Sexual Studies at Yale University. She's also the author of a book, Feminist Theory and Christianity Today. Asked what happens when people died, Jones replied, I don't know. There may be something. There may be nothing. My faith is not tied to some divine promise about the afterlife. Asked how we can reconcile an omnipotent, omnipresent God with evil and suffering, Joan responded, at the heart of faith is a mystery. God is beyond our knowing. Not being or, not being or an essence of an object or an object. But I don't worship an all-powerful, all-controlling, omnipotent, omnipresent being. That is a fabrication of Roman jurisdiction, a jurisdictional theory, and Greek mythology. When Kirsthoff asked her if he could be considered a Christian after not believing the virgin birth or the resurrection, Jones answered and said, "Well, you sound an awful like like you sound an awful lot like me, and I am a Christian minister. It's a Christian minister. It's a new religion. It's a new God. It's formed in the image of the world, and she has constructed a God from postmodern theology that in no way re resembles the God of the Bible." Jones is just another Ph.D. or pothole digger. Deliberately setting a trap to derail someone's faith in the things of God. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Verse 1. At the same time came the disciples of Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and he set him in the midst of them, and he said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as a little child, as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive one such little child? And who shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him or her that a millstone were hung around his neck and that they were dropped in the depth of the sea. See, Jesus doesn't like, nor does God like, people who put stumbling blocks in front of little children. And little children, although he had a physical child, what the reference was, was to have a pure and simple faith. A pure and simple believing, just like a little kid. You sit down, you can talk to a little kid, they'll believe almost anything. See, they don't have all this doubt, all this worry, all this knowledge to rebut 
what you're trying to teach them, what you're trying to teach them. And Jesus said, if someone who wants to believe in me and someone wants to love me and you get in the way and you mess up that person, it'd be better for you that a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Better for them in comparison to what? It would be better for them to take that way out in comparison to having to stand before God and then explain away their deeds on earth. And I want to tell you something. You can use all the fanciful language you want when you stand before God. That goes about this far with him. Okay? Verse 7 says, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to the man or the woman by whom the offense comes. You know, the Bible doesn't use the word woe many times. So when it does, you ought to have ears that stick up like a Doverman. He's trying, he says, woe unto that world and woe unto what? The person by whom offenses come. The word offense, by whom, because of offenses, that Greek word offense is the word scandalon. Scandalon. A scandalon is a movable stick or a trigger on a trap. It's a trap stick. You know, like I told you lots before, I would, I would get a box and i put a stick and a rope to try to catch a rabbit. That's what that stick is. It's a trap. You're setting a trap for someone. It's an implement placed in the way causing one to stumble or fall. To be a teacher. Your teaching should encourage people. Your teaching should show people where the potholes of life are. Okay? Your teaching should show people how to navigate through life. What's right and what's wrong. Your teaching shouldn't cause offenses. You know, a lot of those people who go into seminaries, okay, they go in with a good heart to serve God. And when they come out of a seminary, they don't even believe in God. They believe in social justice. They believe in a social gospel. They believe in all the rhetoric of the left and the progressive movement. They don't know nothing about Jesus Christ. They know nothing about the resurrection and believe less. And yet they started out good. What happened? You had PhDs, PhDs, digging potholes in front of them so they could fall into them, making them twofold the child of hell that they are. The Bible warns about that. And that's a sad state of affairs that we face in our country. Verse 3 says, except you be converted. It's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And become as little children. Verse 1 talks about the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4 talks about the kingdom of heaven. The context is the kingdom of heaven. The context is your final destination, the end goal. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why do you believe what you believe? What is going to be the final reward for your work here and your belief here on earth? Look at Psalm 13, please. Now, a lot of ministers, the majority of ministers, are graduates from theological cemeteries, I mean seminaries. Okay? And they come out and they reflect the teachings of their professors. And a lot of those professors are liberal theologians and teach what's called a modern Christianity. They come out and they go to congregations and they teach the people in the congregations and that's the end of it. They look at a calling of a minister as an occupation, as a way to make money. It's a job. And a lot of them, after X amount of years, just stop and go and do something else. 
and never mention God, mention God again or think about God again. And I know lots and lots of those kind of ministers. Lots of them. See, because it wasn't really deep inside of them. Working for God is not a job. Working for God is a calling. It's when God calls you and you answer. And then the rest of your life is your faithful commitment to carry out what God has given you to do. That's what working for God is. And a true minister. Verse 3 of Psalm 13. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest I sleep the sleep of death. Christians are confused regarding the simple truths of the New Testament and the promise that Jesus made unto his disciples concerning eternal life and a coming kingdom. If you ask an active believing Christian who regularly attends church, what happens to you when you die do you know what most would say? You go to heaven. That's what they say. And you live there with Jesus for the rest of your life. The problem with that answer is that the Bible overflows with a wealth of knowledge pertaining to death, heaven, and eternal life. You know what a worldview is? A worldview is a view of the world used for living. You know what a worldview is? A worldview is a view of the world used for living in the world. A worldview is a mental mode of reality. That's a great definition. It's a mental mode of reality. A comprehensive framework of ideas and attitudes about the world, ourselves, a life. It's a system of beliefs, a system of personally customized theories about the world and how it works. It's personal customized theories. You know what that means? It means you personally customize what you put in your mind. It also means you can change it. A worldview is a basic way of interpreting things and events that pervades our culture so thoroughly that it becomes the culture's concept of reality. What's good, what's important, what's worldview is more than a culture though. It extends to the precepts of time and space, of happiness and well-being, the beliefs and values and behaviors of a culture stem directly from its worldview. Now listen, do you know why many Christians believe they go right to heaven? As soon as they die, because somebody told them that. And they respected and trusted the person that told them that. For some, they see it on TV. And they believe what they see on TV. Or some other show. Yet for others, they were sitting around just talking, and it sounded good to them. God taught me a tremendous lesson this week. There's a very popular news commentator, very honest and sincere in my opinion, who believes in his cause. And when it comes to political things or when it comes to things that he studies, I would defer to this man because he knows much more about those things than I do and he presents them in a logical fashion, where you can see it through common sense. But he made a statement this week about life after death and going to heaven after you die and all these other things, and everybody's up there having a great old time. And when he made that statement, he made that statement with as much conviction and enthusiasm and belief that he made every other statement that he was saying that show. And that taught me a great lesson. 
because, because what it taught me was this man believes in what he's saying, whether he's right or wrong. And he's convincing in what he's saying, whether he's right or wrong. Now, with regards to political issues, I have no say because I know nothing about it. But there are people who listen to him, and because he's a man of integrity and respect, believe and hang on every word he says, whether he's right or wrong. But I do know a little bit about the Bible. Okay? And I would venture to say, as intelligent as this man is, and I'm not boasting, I forgot more about the Bible than he'll ever know. And what he said contradicted the Word of God. But he said it because he believed it, and people who listened to him believed him. And you know what they believed? They believed something that was wrong. That's why you've got to be careful who you listen to, and even more careful on how you hear. Because the great orators of the news and of radio news, everything they say is not right. Republican, Democrat, or Cocker Spaniel. They're not right all the time. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I did not say that you do not go to heaven. I didn't say that. My concern is the timing, the sequence of events that the Word of God teaches that take place before you go to heaven. See, heaven's real, okay? But for most people, they die and they go to heaven. Okay, die and they go to heaven. Okay, well if that's true, then the Bible should teach us that. But the Bible just taught us in Psalm 13, 3, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Well, what do you mean you're going to sleep the sleep of death? What does that mean? If you go to heaven as soon as you die, there's no nothing. You, you're in heaven. You're not sleeping. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, lest I sleep the sleep of death. You know what the sleep of death implies? It means implies that something, but he's going to have to wake you up. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And if you haven't ever heard this before, it's not my fault. Okay? Maybe you ought to go home and read the Bible and what I'm teaching you and see if it's in there or not. 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, we just read about the sleep of death. Now, God, but I would not have you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be dumb. I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be confused. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are what? Asleep. Asleep. Well, what's he talking about? You're going to see what he's talking about. He's talking about the sleep of death. So it's not God's fault that people are ignorant about the sleep of death. You know whose fault it is? The ministers. People like Jones that don't believe in the resurrection, who sit in fanciful places, make six digits a year to be an idiot, a pothole digger, to trip up honest, good, believing people, potential ones anyway. But when she gets done with them, they're worth nothing. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, either as others which have no hope. Don't be sad. Others don't have any hope. Don't be sad about people that are asleep, that were believers, is what he's saying. If we believe that Jesus died, I can't read those words because Joan says it's not real, so I'll just go over to even. If we believe that Jesus died, even so them, it doesn't say that, does it? Yeah. It says even, it says if we believe that Jesus died and what? Yeah. Rose again. Even those which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say, unto you by the word of the university. For this we say unto you by the word of the seminary. 
word of the seminary, by the word of the presiding PhD on over the seminary. No. For this we say unto you by the word of the what? Lord. That which that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, or the word is precede, go before. Those, them which are asleep. Asleep. When Jesus comes back, those of us on earth, some will be alive. But he's not going to grab the people that are alive first. You know what he's going to do? He's going to wake up the people that are asleep in the ground, that believed in him. Read the record with me. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the God, and the dead, the ones that were sleeping in Christ, shall rise what? First. Right? Is that what it says? Mm -hmm. That's what it means. You don't need a commentary. You don't need a, de a degree. It's very simple. People who believe in Jesus Christ in their lifetime and died, fell asleep. See, the reason why the Bible calls it sleep is because if you're a believer, you're getting up again. And it's a figure of speech. It's called a euphemism. And a euphemism is a very gentle, very nice way of putting something that is harsh reality. So God doesn't choose to say dead. He says asleep. But he uses the word dead to make sure that you know what he's talking about. Jesus had to say about Lazarus. He sleeps. Lazarus. He sleepeth, he doeth well. The disciples said, well, if he doeth well, Lazarus is what? Dead. dead. He wanted to get the point, Lazarus is what? Dead. Dead. The dead in Christ rise what? First. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them. Who are the them? The dead in Christ that just got up. Now you got two groups. You got dead people getting up from the ground, and you got mortals going up that are alive and are believers into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So let me ask you a question. If when Jesus Christ comes back to gather his church, to gather the believers, the believers. Why in the world is there a need for the dead in Christ to get up if when you die you go right up to heaven? Hmm? You can't answer that question. You know why you can't answer that question? Because the whole when you die you go to heaven is not true. You do go to heaven, but this is when you go to heaven, not upon death. When you're dead, you know what the Bible says? The dead in Christ rise what? First. He gets you up. Then you're going to heaven. You don't go to heaven as soon as you die. You go to heaven because you get resurrected. Or you get gathered. One of the two. What's the difference? The resurrected ones are the ones that are dead in Christ that get up. The ones that are here alive that don't precede the dead, they get gathered. That's why it's called a gathering. That's why it's called a gathering. That's why it's called the parousia in the Greek, and not a resurrection. Because technically, for a resurrection to occur, everybody would have to be dead. Now, if you go to heaven immediately upon death, and you are instantaneously in the presence of the Lord, who is Jesus raising from the dead when he returns? But he is raising people from the dead. See, because you don't go to heaven immediately upon death and you're not in the presence of the Lord immediately upon death. Do you know that even Jesus Christ, listen to me, even Jesus Christ died? Jesus Christ died. And you know, if anyone had the right to go directly to heaven to stand in the presence of God, it would have been who? Jesus. But he did not. He died. He died. 
And God had to what? From the what? On what? The third day. Ecclesiastes, chapter 9. I have a startling revelation for you. When you're dead, you're dead. You sleep the sleep of death. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. The dead know how much? Nothing. If you're in the presence of Jesus Christ immediately upon death and you're in heaven, do you know something? You better believe you do. The Bible says the dead know nothing. The Bible says the dead know nothing. You know why? Because they sleep the sleep of death. And for them to get up, it depends on Jesus Christ coming back, getting them up. Psalm chapter 6. Verse 5, for in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? That's what the psalmist is saying to God. There's no remembrance. Who's going to praise you in the grave? You're dead. Psalm 115, verse 17. You know, they tell you you're going to go to heaven, you're going to sit around praising God all day. Well, okay, look at what the Bible says. Psalm 115, verse 17. The dead praise not the Lord. Neither do they go down, neither do they that go down in silence. You know why the dead don't praise the Lord? Because they're dead. Don't praise the Lord? Because they're dead. They're asleep. You praise the Lord when you're alive. You praise the Lord when Jesus Christ gets you up from the dead. But the dead praise not the Lord. You know why? Because they're dead. They're dead. And it's that simple. But Christians who have been taught by atheists and who have been contaminated by Greek philosophy has mixed up the two. Remember I said that even Jesus Christ died? And that if anyone had a right to go right into the presence of God, it would have been him. And yet God rose, raised him on what? Why did God raise Jesus Christ on the third day? If you go to heaven as soon as you die. Yeah, but the word purgatory is not in the Bible. Right? It's theology. It's religion. Galatians chapter 1. Jesus wasn't in purgatory, by the way. There is no purgatory. No, it's not in the Bible. It's in religion. And it's only in certain religions. Some religions don't have it. But we're not concerned about religion. We're concerned about what does the Word say. Galatians 1, Dr. Jones. Was that her last name? Dr. Jones, I presume. Dr. Jones didn't read Galatians 1. Paul and Apostle, verse 1. Not by the will of man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the what? Yes. Ephesians 1. Next words. When he what? Raised him from what? The dead. First Peter. Chapter 1, verse 19. By the precious blood of Christ, lamb without blemish, for he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, and is manifest in the last time, who by him, that's the only reason I read those verses, so I could show you it's talking about Jesus Christ, the, blood, the, the lamb of God, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the what? Acts 13.30, but God raised him from what? The dead. Acts 13, verse 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto their children, in that he had raised up Jesus again. That's a religious teaching. That's not what the Bible teaches. 
Okay? You know what else is a religious teaching? That the shepherds were there in the manger, which is really a room in the inn, but it's on the backside of the inn, at the birth of Jesus Christ. That's a religious teaching. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the shepherds came to a house some 14, 16 months later with Joseph and Mary there and the young child. See? But everybody puts shepherds out on their lawn come Christmas time. Hey, I got no problem you want to put a shepherd out. But the point is this. You ought to question some of your beliefs according to the word of God. Because you may be believing something you've heard that has no truth in the Bible. And I would rather put my faith and my eternal life online, my faith and my eternal life online according to the word of God and Jesus Christ than what some man says in a university. Well, Psalm, no, Acts 13 we were, 34. As concerning him that he raised up from the dead, not to return any corruption, he said on this way, wise, I'll give you the sure mercies of David. Who did he raise up from the dead? Jesus Christ. Acts 17, verse 31. Because he, God, hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, talking about Jesus Christ, whereof he had given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from men, in that he hath raised him from what? The dead. He gave assurance to all men. God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Dr. Jones, verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Another said, we'll hear you again on this matter. They thought it was funny. They, they mocked it. Oh, that ain't real. That is not. What are you kidding me? They mocked. They mocked back then. Go to Romans chapter 10. Dr. Jones doesn't believe in a literal resurrection. She mocks. She's a mockingbird. She's a PhD mockingbird, but nonetheless, she's a mockingbird. A pothole digger. With her beak, beak of intelligence, she digs holes in front of potential warm-hearted, heart-like-a-child people that want to go and learn about God, and when they come out, they're atheists. But Dr. Jones is worse than that. See? Because the theology Dr. Jones teaches results in eternal damnation. Because she works for the devil. She's a PhD. She's one of the many PhDs, pothole diggers, that work for the devil. You know what Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says? It says that thou, thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus. That if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that what? God did what? Raised him from the dead. Then you know what the result is? Salvation. Do you see Dr. Jones? Dr. Jones doesn't believe in a resurrection. And I will guarantee you if she doesn't believe in a resurrection, she's not going to teach a resurrection. And according to my Bible, the scripture says you don't get salvation unless you believe that God raised him from the dead. Now who are you going to believe? Dr. Jones, the PhD, who makes six digits a year, or the word of God? See how evil and vicious and black that woman is? And she sits in the seminary as the president who wants to teach young ministers about the gospel. A seminary that was founded on the infected word of God. What has happened? The devil. 
Let's close in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 26. I'm going to read to you out of the English Standard Version. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, English Standard Version. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. This is what God's talking to his ministers. He's telling Paul, talk to your ministers. God said he looked out over the world and he said, the eyes of the Lord search to and fro, looking for someone who he can show himself strong for. And he said, okay, I I want that guy over there. That guy. The one that's not wise according to the world standards. standards. I want that girl over there who's not powerful. The one who's not of noble birth. But God, verse 27, chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. You know what he did? He picked the three stooges so he could shame Washington. That was his choice. He got a good sense of humor. Hey, Mo. (laughs) That's what God did. He chose that which is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose that which is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose that which is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. That's what, so no one can say, these are my credentials, I'm the big know-it-all, I went to Yale, I went to Harvard, I went to all these schools. And you know what's a sad thing about Yale and Harvard and all those Ivy League schools? Their original presidents were genuine clergy who taught the Word of God from those things. Look it up, you don't believe me. They were clergy, real clergy, real, real men of God. God's the source of your life in Christ Jesus. Verse 30 who God made our wisdom and our righteousness and our sanctification and redemption. Therefore it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in who? The Lord. The Lord. Lord. See? Unless the simple tenets of Christianity are very simple and clear, stay away from those people. Stay away from those people. Stay away from those teachings. And here's a simple tenet of Christianity. That lady didn't believe in the virgin birth. Trust me. Jesus Christ was born of Mary, a virgin. Okay? That lady didn't believe in the resurrection. Trust the Bible. The Bible says that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The lady doesn't believe in miracles or in prayer. God answers prayer. God performs miracles. See, All that pothole digger is doing is digging a trap. And when the innocent, prospective, young Christians come along, they fall into that trap. And you know what the sad part is? Most of them never recover. Because they get more smart, more information, they're more intelligent, and by getting that, they're getting more evil. Because God doesn't choose the things of the world. He made those things foolish. It says, knowledge puffeth up. That's what the Bible says. So let's pray. And be thankful that you know the truth. And you can read the truth. And we'll continue with this because I want to tell you something. There's over a hundred scriptures in the Bible. I won't read them all to you, but there's over a hundred scriptures in the Bible that teach that once you die, you're dead. And that the resurrection is what the Christian and non-Christian waits for to get up, to be in the presence of the Lord, and to go to heaven. Okay? And I'll read you some of them next week. But there's over a hundred. And there's not one verse of Scripture. Listen to me. There's not one verse of scripture in the Bible, sure in the Bible, that says when you die, you go to heaven. And if you don't believe me, go look it up.
There's not one. But there's over a hundred that teach what the greatness of the truth of God's word is. So, Father, thanks for your word, your love, your goodness. It's not our intent to frazzle people's minds, except that we frazzle them into believing your word and not religion. We thank you that we can trust your word and that we can depend on it, just like Jesus trusted your word, so much so that he went to the cross knowing that you promised to raise him from the dead, and we have that promise also if we should fall asleep before the Lord returns. Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And remember, if we are shut down for some type of censorship reason, you can always check out our videos at www.cvm.church. Thank you for your patronage. This was brought to you by Chapter and Verse Ministry.